So today I want to talk about how stable coins work. But before I talk about how stable coins work, I want to take a minute to talk about why we need stable coins in the first place. Why not just use Venmo?、Um, and I think that's a valid question, and I have a short answer for it and a long answer for it. And so I'll start with the short answer.、Um, and I think I can best give the short answer by telling a story about Japan.、Um, so Japan, and especially Tokyo, was very slow to adopt e commerce as compared to the United States. And the reason for that was that there are stores everywhere in Tokyo. And so it doesn't make sense to go to Amazon to buy a pair of shoes when there's 10 shoe stores on your street. So, similarly in the United States,、uh, payment rails and banking services are pretty well developed. If you want to pay for something without carrying around cash, there are debit cards. If you want to get a small scale loan to pay for something, there are credit cards. If you want to easily send money to a friend across the country, there's PayPal or Venmo. But 1.7 billion people in the world don't have bank accounts. And about 3.5 billion people in the world don't have active bank accounts. So half the world doesn't have the ability to receive money across a distance, to build a credit history, to receive a long term loan. For half the world, it's difficult to enter into a financial contract, it's difficult to put up collateral, it's difficult to get insurance. And for many people in the world, it's even difficult to get access to a currency that they trust. Cryptocurrencies and the blockchain and smart contracts more generally give the tools to create all of these payment rails, inexpensive remittances, credit histories, escrow, et cetera, for the billions of underbanked. But all of these things make, sense, make less sense with a volatile cryptocurrency. The example that I, like, I love to give here is、um, the first purchase in Bitcoin was in 2009, and it was for a pizza. And that pizza cost about 10,000 Bitcoin, which was about $60 million today. And it equally doesn't feel great to denominate a contract in Bitcoin.、Um, if you denominate your mortgage in Bitcoin, you might find that your mortgage payments triple from month to month. And so, what we want. For this set of applications, is we want a set of cryptocurrencies that are relatively stable compared to the cost of goods in a region. We want these currencies to be trusted by the consumer as a medium of exchange. So, how do we do this? I'll start the answer to this question by giving a brief history of stable coins because I think it's easiest to understand the mechanisms by understanding how the mechanisms evolved. And the first credible stable coin proposal was in 2014 by someone named Robert Sams, and he called this proposal Signured Shares. The basic intuition is as follows you create a new coin, let's call it X. You set a peg, say you set the peg for $1, and then you monitor the price of the exchange.、Uh, you monitor the price of the coin on, on the exchanges or the market. If the price of your coin goes above $1, That means the demand is too high given the supply. And so there's a natural solution to that, which is to print more coin until the demand meets the supply at the price peg. Conversely, if the price goes below a dollar, that means that the, the supply is too big given the demand. And so then the natural thing to do is to contract the number of coins in circulation until supply meets demand at the dollar price point. Now, the great thing about this is all of it can be done algorithmically in a decentralized way with open source code that's visible to everybody and auditable by anybody. This engenders a lot of trust. Because it's open source, you know exactly what the protocol will do. And because it's written in code, you know that the protocol will do it. So, Robert Sams never launched Signer and Shares, but it was an enormously inf influential paper that laid the intellectual foundation for a class of stablecoin that I'll call algorithmic stablecoins. Now, at around the same time, hedge funds who were doing high frequency trading or even moderate fr frequency trading were running into a practical problem. They wanted to get in and out of Bitcoin reasonably quickly.、Um, But it was difficult to get in and out of Bitcoin when you had to convert to dollar, wire it to a bank account, and then wire it back. So, one of the exchanges created a stable coin called Tether. And the theory behind Tether was that there was a bank account, 
and that for every tether that somebody buys through the exchange, the exchange would deposit one dollar into the bank account. Then if somebody needs to redeem a tether, if they were unable to find a counterparty, they could redeem it directly on the exchange for a dollar. Now the drawback to tether is that unlike the open source cryptocurrency that I described previously, it's, 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 there's no way for a user of Tether to inspect the code to see that it is doing what it says it does. Instead of relying on inspecting and auditing the code, people have to rely on trust in the operator. Now, despite that drawback, Tether has remained remarkably stable over the few years that it's been running, and it laid the intellectual foundation for a class of stable coins that I'll call fiat-backed stable coins many with lots of improvements that are aimed to bolster trust in the operator. For example, more transparency, regular auditing, insurance, and so on and so forth. So far, we've talked about two I've talked about two classes of stable coins. Algorithmic stable coins, whose benefits are that they can be operated in a decentralized manner, that they can be completely written in code, that their code can be made open source and inspectable and auditable by anybody. And their limitations are that, in practice, it's difficult to, to handle large contractions without a reserve. And we've also discussed fiat-backed stablecoins, whose benefits are that they are collateralized, and because they're collateralized, they're easy to understand. But there are two limitations to fiat-backed stablecoins. The first is that they're by nature centralized, and so they're brittle to the operator, the central operator. Your trust in the coin is completely dependent on the trust and your trust in the operator. And the second limitation, and this is subtler, but I think it's even more important, is that all they can be is a proxy to fiat. Um, and I think this misunderstands the true potentiality of cryptocurrencies. It's like using the power of the internet to put the Encyclopedia Britannica online. Um, it's useful, and there's a place for that, but the internet could do so much more than that. And so, to give an example of what this means in the context of cryptocurrencies, I want to give an example. And the example that I'll give is um, borrowed from one of my favorite thinkers, who's a philosopher named Charles Eisenstein. Um, and he wrote a book called Sacred Economics. And he's, in the book, he said, you know, Whatever backs money, people tend to make more of, uh, because it's like printing money. So when gold backed money, there was intense incentive to mine gold. And so he said, well, why don't we back money with things that we like, like, like forests or clean rivers? Um, we, by doing that, we can incentivize the creation of the things that we want to see in the world. And he called this natural capital-backed currencies, and I think it's a beautiful idea. And it is one of those ideas that is possible in crypto, but it's not possible to do with fiat-backed crypto. So now I'll introduce a third class of coins called crypto-backed stablecoins. And it's a hybrid between the two. I, I call them crypto-backed stablecoins, but in practice they're a hybrid between crypto-backed stablecoins and algorithmic stablecoins. And to give a rough intuition of what a mechanism like this looks like, in a crypto-backed stablecoins, people will purchase the stablecoin with other crypto that they have. And that other crypto then gets placed into a reserve. And so, for example, if you want to buy $1 worth of the stablecoin, you, uh, you can purchase it with $1 worth of ETH, and that ETH gets deposited in a reserve. Um, the reserve naturally will then get, often get diversified. And because it's all in crypto, the protocol can be written entirely in code, in code, open sourced, and operated in a decentralized manner. This is the upside. But also because it's crypto, its value can change. And so most crypto-backed stablecoins have additional stability mechanisms. Uh, different cryptos have different mechanisms, but some common ones are over collateralizing the reserve or having transaction fees go to bolster the reserve, or having mining rewards go to bolster the reserve. All of these provide additional stability, and they can be done algorithmically, predictably, and in an open source manner. So I've introduced three mechanisms for stablecoins, and each has their pros and their cons. 
Now, all of this begs the question, why don't governments just introduce their, their own stable coins, their own fiat stable coins? And first I say, I think that would be a good idea, um, and a number of governments are already starting to explore this. Um, but second is, I think that's just the beginning of the story. The whole story is we're moving inevitably to a world in which both store of value and medium of exchange are ecologies rather than objects. And I think this will create a more prosperous world. Let me give an example. Um, about 25 years ago, in a city in Brazil called Curitiba, they had a garbage problem. The streets in the favelas were too narrow for garbage trucks, and as a consequence, garbage was, was littering the streets and finding its way to the river. At the same time, in the city, there was an underutilized bus system. So the mayor started a program in which he would exchange bus tokens for garbage. Um, at a certain point, well, what happened was that people in the favelas would start collecting garbage, bringing them, exchanging them for bus tokens, and, having the bus to and then using the bus tokens to go downtown and look for work. But this is where it gets interesting. At a certain point, the bus tokens started circulating in the favelas as currency, effectively allowing people to spend more time collecting garbage than they had the inde independent use for bus tokens, the independent need for bus tokens. As a consequence, the, street got clean, the streets got cleaned, the river was remediated, many people found jobs, and many people found pride in doing meaningful work in their community. And what was this really? It was a stablecoin, pegged to the price of a bus fare, backed by environmental remediation efforts, and sitting alongside the Brazilian real. It unlocked an underutilized human capacity and it increased the prosperity and purpose of a group of people who needed more of both. You could imagine that the world could use many more of these kinds of things. And that is my longer answer for stablecoins. Uh, it's because they not, not only are stablecoins necessary for micropayments, for peer-to-peer -peer insurance, for any kind of smart contract, but they are necessary to enable, at scale, stories like Kurichiba. And so I want to close with a personal story. Um, about 25 years ago, um, I was a kid, and I happened on the internet for the first time. And it was mind-blowing for me as a kid. I, I mean, never mind that it didn't really work. There was no one really on the internet, and people were dialing up with 28 8 baud modems. Um, but the internet did two things to media. One is it made media accessible, so lots of people could create media, and lots of people could have access to media. And second, it made media programmable. And I had a sense that the accessibility and programmability of media would lead to lots of exciting things, although I didn't have an imagination big enough to understand what they, were, what they would be. At the time, I was thinking, it could be possible for me to write a computer game and share it with the whole world. Um, now, a couple years ago, a, co a colleague of mine showed me an app that he built that enabled people to use the camera on their Android phone to take a picture of their eye. And what the app would then do is it would compare it to a database of thousands of eyes in the cloud and diagnose whether that eye was at the early stages of diabetes-induced blindness. Diabetes-induced blindness is one of the biggest causes of blindness in the world, and is completely reversible if caught early. But most people in the world don't have access to an ophthalmologist who can diagnose it in the early stages. But now, with this app, they have the ability to just download an app onto their cheap Android phone and diagnose it themselves. And this is amazing, and it's the kind of thing that becomes possible when you make media accessible and programmable. And I share this story because in the same way that the internet made media accessible and programmable, the technology of the blockchain does the same for money. It makes money accessible and programmable. And I see this as just as exciting as the internet. It introduces potentially, uh, the potentialities to do good in the world in ways that I can't even predict right now, 
just as I couldn't predict in 1994 my colleague's, my colleague's ophthalmology app. And for me, that gives me a sense of wonder and of hope. And I hope that I was able to convey that sense of hope uh, in my talk today. Thank you.